Brought to you by BedroomBattlefields.com, this is the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. On this episode of the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast, we're joined by legendary game designer Alessio Cavatori, a man whose credits include titles like Warhammer 40k, Kings of War and Bolt Action. He even once played a dead guy in the Lord of the Rings film Return of the King. There's an old quote often attributed to Mark Twain that says, I'm sorry for the long letter, I didn't have time to write a short one. And that reminds me in a lot of ways of Alessio's approach to game design and rules writing. Anyone could sit there and add more text, more rules and more pages, but the best rule sets, in my opinion, are the ones where the creator has taken the time to prune, cut the fat and make every word in there earn its place. And the result for the player, as Alessio points out himself, is that you could now focus on tactics and narrative rather than constant book checking and rules interpretation. But anyway, we don't need me to explain all this when we're going to hear it from the river horse's mouth. See what I did there, river horse. Uh, So let's kick things off as we do in these episodes by asking Alessio why he thinks this hobby still exists. Well, I think it's to do with uh, the physicality of it with the fact that uh, these days we spend an incredible amount of time on screens, on computers, and and we don't meet people in in reality face-to-face, like this interview we are doing uh, across uh, (laughs) across the the web. So uh, there's a lot of um, impersonal uh, in our lives these days, and therefore having a hobby that is twofold, very grounded in reality twofold because one is you have to play with people meeting them often big quantity of people if you go to events and so there's a social element to it and also the the fact that it is a craft it is a a physical tangible smellable (laughs) hobby where you you know you you, you're painting you're building there's the glue getting to your fingers there's the there's the uh, the 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 paint that you drink instead of your tea because you get confused there's a the smell of the paint drying uh, there's uh, there's the uh, getting stabbed in the fingers by your the spears of your toy soldiers, then bringing them to the to the to the place, the, the packaging, putting them in the suitcase, and moving them around the table. So there's a it's very real, it's very tangible, it's very the opposite of you know everything being on a screen, and uh, and and you need to people meet, need to meet people in person, which is the other side of it of uh, sociability. So yeah, I think that's what makes it survive and thrive and be a I think a positive thing. What's your favourite book of all time? <laughs> not not a tough one at all. No, I I think probably people that have seen other interviews or anything like that with me. I mean, it always always comes to. Uh, I always say, look, I'm not religious, but in my life, the one thing that is closest to a, a religion is Tolkien is the Lord of the Rings. Uh, for me, that book is the book I always read, I can quote from, and you know, it is, if anything, I try to convert other people <laughs> to, to the Tolkien religion. So yes, no, I, I'm a, it's a big thing. It's a big thing for me, in my life, on, on many levels. And yes, yeah, so definitely it's a very straightforward answer. Yes, Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings. And why? Why? Sorry, just was, was that, that, that I see that the question also has why is that your favorite book? Well, it's because um, I read it at school when I was a lad in Italian, and uh, was immediately, you know, captured. And uh, I had then to read everything Tolkien had written, then read everything in English again. So this is like, okay, right, mm, I don't want to read the translation. I want to, I want to read the real thing and because I can do that. So I, I basically collected it all, read it all, collected all the, you know, like a, every year I would buy the calendar by John Howe, Alan Lee, uh, all the games that have to do with it. And uh, so basically I was a big user of it. And uh, the, I mean, for me, the reason, I guess, why that story resonates so much is that it feels like reading history. It feels like reading reality. Uh, it is so well researched in all the all the philological studies that Tolkien did. All, it just, for me, it has a 
it's like part of like when you I don't know study I don't know Babylonian culture Babylonian civilization you can go there's a myths and legends there's a history there's their battles there and it feels like one of those it feels like you're reading history it doesn't feel like you're reading fantasy and that, that I think is incredible and I don't think anybody managed to get there but I mean Game of Thrones has that feel so the, the, there are others that have gone there but obviously Tolkien was a first he created a genre again in terms of you know literary <laughs> from a literary point of view there are not many books which are the this I uh, will create a new <laughs> genre completely so yeah for all of those reasons who or what is your biggest inspiration in what you do well, I mean, what I do is making games. And I think uh, of all the people that I met throughout my career, I mean, there's, there's many that I uh, learned from. But I always say that there's two people that for me personally, I look up to, particularly as people that have, have taught me so much. And uh, not just about creating games, also about being a nice person, <laughs> I would say. And I always say I, it's, I can never decide between uh, Rick Priestley and Jarvis Johnson. Those are, you know, my senpai, sensei. They are my mentors, if you want, and people that I can, I'm lucky enough that I can call friends as well. So, yeah, it's those two people and the incredible contribution they've done to, to various hobbies, but obviously Wargaming hobby in particular. Uh, you know, the Whenever I I need advice, I always try to go to those two people. That they are my yeah my go to <laughs> people, and the people that indeed have inspired me the most. What's your best value budget hobby purchase of less than twenty pounds? That's something that actually is connected to another question that I've seen. Uh, I don't really do hobby in the sense that I play lots of games including war games, but the hobby side, the, the, the painting, collecting, modeling side is not really my thing. And therefore, I have to go by early experiences of hobby when I still actually had to go and tried. And what I say, what I would buy now is definitely that magnify lens with the little arms and the, and the pliers that holds the things for you because, frankly, there is no chance for me doing any of that now <laughs> considering my eyesight. So I would definitely go for one of those. It seems like a, you know, a must-have. <laughs> if you could live in any historical period, where, when, and why? Well, if I could choose to live... I mean, the real realistic answer is if I could choose, I would say right now, right here. I we are living in the most peaceful period of history. Maybe I mean twenty years ago, even more peaceful, but because there was no Ukraine going on. Uh, but I mean, the modern last few, last you know, from the end of World War II, uh, the, the, if you look at the the deaths in uh, in war, both civilians and military, uh, the, these is the most peaceful centuries for for Earth. Because I mean, modern wars tend to be normally uh, ukraine also has changed that but they tended to be very asymmetric so that there wasn't really two big power going at each other and therefore the, 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 there wasn't a, the huge amount of casualties we're used to world war ii world war one um, so you know if i had to be rational i would say now very, you know the best level of medicine that you can ever experience in, in history the, the best level of uh, of peace <laughs> so yes of course that's the you know the rational answer the romantic answer it would be, oh, wow, I would love to be a knight. I would love to be a knight or, or, or a merchant dash explorer in maybe the Middle Ages, like Crusades time. Because obviously being exploring like Marco Polo, exploring, going to the East and Samarkand on the, on the Silk Road and exploring, interacting with you know, the, 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 the Mongols, the Chinese culture, and uh, as, a, as, a, as a European, maybe from Venice. You know, that, that sounds incredibly fascinating because you, you can smell the spices and, and the sea breeze as you, as you sail to, to the East. So that sounds fascinating. But whether it's as a merchant, uh, as, a, as an explorer, a uh, Dash explorer, Marco Polo, or uh, as a knight, you know, but again, as a knight in the idealized version of what a knight should be, as opposed to probably reality, you know, a knight as in helping the helpless, you know, you, you are strong, you are trained, you are equipped to fight, but 
you fight to defend people in need. So that vision of the knight, which obviously <laughs> probably not terribly historical, more of a fantasy version of it or a romantic version of it. So yes, I would say if I do, if I go with the heart rather than the the, the mind, I would say yeah, the crusades times. Yes. Yeah, I think I need to start putting a caveat on that question that you you are also invincible. Like you go back in time, you're invincible. <laughs> yes, uh, that, that it's, helps. <laughs> it's, it's one of those where like you go back in time at a certain period, you're dead within like one day because you yes. know, somebody stabbed you in the guts. And I mean, if, if you're a if you're a disembodied uh, specter uh, ghost, then you can watch things. Of course, there are other things that you would love to see. You know, how did they build the pyramids? <laughs> You know, I, you know that kind of stuff. I was like, oh, I would like to see what big battles were like in reality being on the field if I didn't risk being killed. Like, whoa, Waterloo, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff. So, you know, that, that caveat is an important caveat indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with history then, uh, do you think there are any underutilized settings or periods in tabletop gaming? Well, I... It's difficult because it's... Pretty much everything has been utilized, but obviously, I, I guess what I think I would like to see more, I guess, is the samurai period, the kind of the Sengoku Jidai, the, the Warring States period in, in Japan, because I think that is incredibly wargameable in the sense that you have these factions which all have colors, and every model has, you know, <laughs> as a little sashimono with the with the flag and the color uh, and the symbol of the clan. So I think has that visual impact, which is. They, those armies, you know, at least on paper, at least in, on the table, look fantastic with all the colors. And uh, the obviously, the you know, just before they started to use um, firearms, you know, or when firearms were you know a novelty and not so much so common, I think there was a lot of that uh, again, almost romanticized uh, dual uh, training swords, which you know I've done kendo for many years, and so obviously the the idea of uh, in particular, if I'm invincible, <laughs> being an invincible samurai it will be fantastic. So yes, wargaming, samurai, if I go for historical fantasy, ooh, uh, Ghost in the Shell. I don't know if you know the anime manga. That would be a good setting for a, for, for a sci-fi wargame. But anyway, let's move on. What might people be surprised to hear that you're not very good at? Well, I already kind of said, but uh, what I do get very often is because of my career, because of working in war games so many years and games workshop and everything, people always invite me to be a judge on a painting competition. <laughs> it's like, oh, come to this to this event. Yeah, can you judge the painting competition? And I always go, no, <laughs> no, I, I can play a charity game if you want in that. Yeah, we, we could, you know, do some Q&As, design questions, but no, not a painting competition. That would be false and I wouldn't feel correct at judging a painting competition because I don't paint. <laughs> Which, again, some people are really, what? <laughs> you don't paint? It's like, no. No, 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 no. I painted three models, I think, in my life uh, that they came up so badly that I was like, and took so much time that I was like, you know, no, I love playing toy soldiers. I love painted armies. I will commission them and you know design the the army, have somebody assemble it and paint it and pay them. <laughs> so that, that is my painting tip normally. It's like, yeah, yeah, get somebody good and not too expensive. <laughs> get them to paint your army. Uh, uh, so yeah, I guess that the most common surprise for me with people in the wargaming world is that like yeah no I don't paint at all <laughs> not at all it's a, I think it's I don't like it I tend to I like whenever I tried I felt like I could spend my time reading a book or playing a game or <laughs> doing something else which is never a good sign when you gotta go I don't want to be doing this <laughs> so that's the one what have you recently changed your mind about <laughs> yes <laughs> the very honest answer K-pop. <laughs> <laughs> that was my daughter basically i always you know she's uh, very much into into k-pop and uh, she always tried to make me listen to k-pop and i was like no, 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 no for me no sorry no no i'm not interested no 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 and then eventually i uh i had to take her to a concert big concerts sixty-five thousand people in hyde park you know and the, the the group was blackpink like a, one of the biggest second biggest band in the world at the moment in terms of uh of hype and following and link and likes and stuff so i was like well she had to have a grown-up to go there 
uh, and to be me. So I went and went to the concert and watched the concert with her. And I have to say that changed my mind. I am now a fan. <laughs> I was like, wow, there was very good. It was actually very good. These people are very professional, very good at what they do. The, the way they, they use the crowd and play to the crowd and, and, you know, and all the kind of thing that's been built around it is, uh, yeah, I, I was like, well, we're okay. No, I'm you're, okay. I, I agree with you, Lou. Yeah, this, 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 this is actually quite enjoyable. <laughs> so that's the last thing, latest thing I changed my mind on. So is that the Spotify playlist in the car now? <laughs> yes, as long as my wife is not around, it's fine. Yes, she she, <laughs> she does not approve. <laughs> so if it's me and my daughter, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, next one up is uh, when was the last time something in the hobby surprised you? I guess another easy one. I think that the big one was, of course, when Games Workshop made the big decision and uh, terminated the old world, and that was a bit of like, whoa, okay, you know, uh, because again, at the time I had already left, so I it was completely news to me. It wasn't like maybe if you were working inside, you could see it coming, but from my point of view as an external person, then it was very much a surprise. I was like, okay, they're doing what? Okay, and then you know, rationally as a person that runs a business etc you understand business reasons you understand ip protection or so you know on a, on a rational level i understand uh, obviously if i put myself as just as a as a user as a fan of that world uh, a person that has played role play games in that world and uncountable battles in that world etc so a person for would that for whom that world was very really real very real then it's a bit of a shock of course it was a bit of a shock but you know that may, but apparently it's coming back. I don't know. We'll see. You're curious. Will you play that when it comes back? Will you give it a wee shot? Probably. I mean, I have. Uh, I still have a Skaven army, and uh, I use it. Uh, uh, the people invite me to sixth edition tournaments. <laughs> so I went to play one a few months ago in Hinkley at the Black Dragon Miniatures store, and uh, it was good fun. I mean, I was completely useless, and I don't remember the rules anymore. It's just funny because obviously sixth edition is pretty much the. <laughs> <laughs> it's my name everywhere on the main rule book, on the lots of army books, etc. And yeah, it was hilarious because people assume that you remember everything. And of course, it was like, no, there was like 15, 20 years ago, I've done a million other games in between. So no, I remember nothing <laughs> at all. It's just funny. It's still enjoyable. Uh, an enjoyable experience. Have you ever tried Age of Sigmar? No. No. No interest in trying it? No, uh, well, basically, to be honest, I have very limited time for, for gaming, and I tend to spend it on games that I'm involved with on a professional level, like uh, Bolt Action. So I tend, to, whenever I have, like, war gaming time, these days I play World War Two. <laughs> so fantasy, not as much. As I said, they did, they did invite me to this uh, sixth edition thing, and, and I went and I enjoyed it. But it, normally what I tend to do these days is historical gaming. I'm an old gamer. <laughs> Tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. <laughs> there is not such thing as too simple a game. Uh, so I, I always have this argument where I go, simpler, 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 cut, 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 cut. And they go like, no, no, you need a bit of grit. You need a bit of uh, granularity. You need a bit of... A, I, I don't like those words. I've... <laughs> I just go, no, 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 I disagree entirely. I think, uh, you know, simple is always better. <laughs> I, I, some people use the word simplistic, and I sort of go, no, I think that, again, no, it, there is simple, which is good. Simplistic implies that simple can be bad. I was like, I disagree. <laughs> uh, you know, that's obviously a, a radical position. It's a... It's a it, is referring to the holy grail of game design, which is chess, in my opinion, in the sense, not that chess particularly being the, the ultimate game, but in terms of when you play chess, you're not thinking about the rules. You're not thinking, oh, how does the pawn move? How, how can, see if the bishop that that, can the knight then do this? Or, I don't know, maybe I should check the rules. And your brain is not thinking of the rules. The brain is thinking of the game. You're thinking... So if I attack on the left, if I do this, and then I support it with this, then I become stronger here. And so you're playing the battle, you're playing the thing, the rules don't exist. 
they're not in your head. You, you're not using any iota of power, brain power on the rules. So for me, that's the holy grail. It would be to have a war game where you don't think of the rules. The rules are in, that nobody thinks of the rules. You're thinking of the game, right? Obviously, for war gaming in particular, with such so many variable and you know, not, not, not a grid, it is not, a, I don't think it's possible, but is nice to aspire to. Interestingly, uh, like Kings of War was the first game that I got when I read the book cover to cover and thought with confidence, I understand this. Like when I was young, I had, you know, Warhammer and everything, and I knew how to move troops and, and do basic fighting. But when I got back in the hobby and adult life and read the, the first edition of Kings of War, I'm sure it was, I just remember like putting the book down and thinking, I understand that. I know I know how to play this in its entirety, which was really cool. Which is interesting. If you refer to the first edition of Kings of War, that was actually an eight pages concertina leaflet, not, not the rule book. <laughs> because that was the, the point. The point was, I did say to Ronnie at the time, I can write your war game in eight pages. And he was like, you mean a summary, intro thing? I was like, no, 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 no. A full war game with army lists, <laughs> points in eight pages. And it's going to work fine, great. And uh, he was like, you wouldn't believe me that I did. And he, then he believed me. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> yes. So yes, indeed, uh, that I think is a good point specifically about that, about the don't judge a book by its size, like like Yoda. <laughs> don't judge a game by its size, by the size of its rule book. Tell me something you once believed about the hobby that turned out not to be true. I guess going back to that, what I said is I used to believe that you could achieve in wargaming perfection in terms of watertight rules completely. That's the holy grail that I discussed before. I thought it was possible. I spent quite a few years of my career trying to get there, exactly that. The, the perfect game that nobody would argue anything about ever. Yeah, and so it's like, nope, nope, simple, like chess, a game. You know, there's, there's no rules arguments when you're playing chess. So that, but with wargaming. And of course, after many years of living in this world and trying and experiencing all of this, I had to come to the conclusion that actually for wargaming, it cannot happen and the reason why it cannot happen is you're writing rules for a thing that people change and everybody at home has a different thing they're playing or tournaments as in they play on a different table they have different terrain they have different units models it is less precise it is, by its nature it's full of variables that you cannot really force people to follow it's not like this is a chessboard. <laughs> it's eight by eight squares, and these are the pieces. Go. This is obviously in war game. There's so much variety in terms of troops, in terms of rules, in terms of uh, units, special rules, see particularly. Uh, and so there's a lot of vari- uh, variables in the text, in the rules, but there's also a lot, uh, even more variables in the physical uh, space where you have measuring with tape measures, basing models. There's a craft element that makes everybody's terrain collection different. So how do you write rules that work for people that have houses, buildings that don't open, and some other people have buildings that do open, and you can put soldiers inside and stuff. It's like, uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, by its nature, I understand it cannot be done as tight as chess, but it can be certainly done as tight as possible, which I think is still, a, you know, you can still try to get there. Are there any common hobby myths and misconceptions that make you roll your eyes? Make me roll my eyes. I, uh, to, the, to the risk of sounding like a broken record, I what makes me roll my eyes is when uh, people uh, want more rules. You know, they go, "Oh, big book it must be a good game." Oh, look, so so few games, it must not be a good game. Is that association of good game equal has to have a lot of stuff? For me, is the other way around. So whenever I hear that argument, I kind of go, "That then I definitely roll my eyes and go, oh, I, I, yeah, I think it's the other way around." I think you know, smaller <laughs> rules, better game, as opposed to more rules, better game. Are there any particularly satisfying mechanics you've either created yourself or came across whilst playing someone else's game? Yeah, I thought of uh, thought of both actually. In terms of um, 
somebody else's. Uh, I was uh, it was Massimo Toriani, an Italian game designer uh, that uh, he and a friend uh, at the tournament. He showed me this uh, or an event. I don't remember, but he showed me this game that he designed and uh, and he was using D tens as scatter dice, whereby because unlike the other the, the you know the, the, all the other uh, polyhedral dice are all platonic perfect solid so they are symmetrical there is no there is no direction in any they are all you know, squares uh, pentagons there's no uh, arrow there's no verse this way or that way the d10 the d10 is not is not a platonic solid is not a perfect solid so all the faces and uh, to be a platonic solid you have to have the same angles all the faces have to be the same uh, at the same distance and the same angle etc while the d10 is not like that the d10 is artificially made to be 10 faced but is not it definitely has a an arrow shape each face of it each face of the 10 faces is an arrow and has a number in it so it was just like well, you don't need scatter dice and distance, etc. You just roll a d10, and that tells you distance and range in the same thing. And I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> yes, of course! <laughs> Why didn't we think of this?" <laughs> so since then, I, I do that as well, and in games I design, and uh, yeah, it just works. And you think it's so obvious, and also one uh, zero to ten or one to ten, zero to nine. So you know, it's also a good chunky, nice round number. So you kind of go. Wow. <laughs> so that was somebody else's mechanic. My mechanics? Oof, uh, I mean, there's, there's a bigger one, which I guess is the, the one that proved very successful and is good fun. I still really enjoy it, is the, is the drawing the, the dice, the action dice from, from, the, from the bag in bolt action uh, because of the dynamic that creates the game. On the other end, of course, I have to say, I hesitate to say that's the mechanic I created because drawing chits is not, you know, is not, it's been done before. I, I kind of added the fact that the dice actually has the orders and therefore you can then use the same thing you use for the drawing as the marker on the unit. So that kind of does a few jobs together. Uh, but yeah, that I'm writing the game and sticking to that logic was cool. But again, I don't think it's as original as perhaps when I invented the, the, the rattling gun. <laughs> the mechanic for the rattling gun, which again, as far as my my, my senpais, my my mentors tell me, Jervis, etc., and Rake, they they hadn't seen it before, and normally that's a good thing that you know because normally I go, I have this great idea, it's completely new, and Rick goes, well, that was done in uh, 1976 in this game, and I was like, oh, <laughs> it's not new, right? <laughs> but this one now, they went, oh, wow, that's a cute little mechanic that we never. Yeah, no, it's fun. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Is basically is a is a, like a mini gun, like a like a rat, like a gatling gun. It's a rattling gun because it's a scaven weapon, but it is the mechanic of you roll a dice and that's the number of shots, and then you can stop safely. You're just basically cranking, doing one turn to the crank, or you can go no, let's have two turns, and so you roll two dice adding them together so more hits however if, if you ever roll a double then something goes wrong and there's a chart of uh, wacky <laughs> nastiness that happens so basically you can roll you know all I don't know this is a maximum but basically up to six dice uh, six dice if you're incredibly lucky you don't get any doubles but you know there's a point where you go mm, statistically I should stop but maybe I need one more one more crank one more turn to, the, to this so so yeah that it is fun because it kind of challenges your greed towards the, the potential punishment if you go wrong. So, yeah, that one maybe. Do you have any advice for those who want to follow your path? Uh, yeah, what I, I mean, I get this question very often at events and stuff. Uh, so uh, the normal answer for me is get a job in the industry uh, because a lot of people want to be a game designer and therefore maybe look out for game designer positions, etc., of which there are very few. And therefore, you probably don't stand much of a chance. There's a lot of competition for those few positions, etc. So I, I would always say, get a job in the industry. Just get a job. It doesn't matter what job. Just get in. Uh, you know, start working in a store uh, if it's games worker. <laughs> but get involved because then, if you're in, if you're inside, if you start to have experience of many things in the same in that hobby in that industry. Frankly, your chances of 
ended up doing that job, a creative job, a designer job, I think are higher than from the outside. So that would be get into get into the industry, not as a game, not necessarily as a game designer, would be my advice. So let's talk about River Horse then. What's uh, what's the latest where what what you're up to there? River Horse. Yeah, well we we continue our uh, our Jim Henson collection. We just added a, a Fraggle game, a Fraggle Rock get card, card game, which is yeah, it's a little family game. It's just like memory snap. It's very, very for kids, effectively. Uh that is incredible the amount of people that actually still remember that program and uh, sing the song. So <laughs> like we I've many got it in my head now. <laughs> exactly. Many, many <laughs> handsome properties have that charming uh element to them. And Labyrinth continues to be the, the best seller is still. You know, incredible. I was at an event at an event in uh, High Wycombe. They did a like a labyrinth themed masquerade ball and fantasy market, and I, I met Brian Froud. He autographed my Dark Crystal book, so it, it was it was very very cool to meet people. There. There's still a lot of love for for that. So obviously we continue with that, but at the same time also we try new stuff. Like um, well, we keep going with our uh, My Little Pony, <laughs> a role play game. But um, the new thing, the new thing that i'm really excited about is we just literally announced that we have the ghost in the shell uh license uh which is this uh, for people that don't know it is uh, for for me is a big thing i am a big fan but i realized a few years ago now uh, it's a cyberpunk uh I would say is the cyberpunk uh, manga uh, in the 90s, basically started the whole, it was that and Akira were the big ones. Uh, and they, uh, so Ghost in the Shell and Akira were the ones that kind of started the genre. Uh, and and there has been a million different versions of similar stories, etc. But the, the author, Masamune Shiro, is, if you read the, the graphic novel, which is what we are, based our, our games on, it is, Definitely, if you want to read cyberpunk manga, that is the the go-to one. You have to read The Ghost in the Shell. And so being able to make games in that setting is, uh, is very exciting for me. Yeah, you've had so many cool licenses, haven't you, over the years? Like you touched on <laughs> Labyrinth there, but there's, there's so many, isn't there? Yeah, Terminator, which has a... Uh, I mean, obviously that has expired now, but the game still has a following. People still play it as a Facebook group and I kind of look at... So yeah, the the, the rule set was quite uh, successful from what I'm told, uh, which is nice. May pick it up with some other licenses. <clears throat> um, and um, we did Hunger Games, we did uh, Highlander. Yeah, so now we did quite a few and Pacific Rim, of course. So yes. Thanks very much for listening to this episode of the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. If you enjoy the show, then please do share it with someone else you think might enjoy it too. And be sure to check out our Discord community of like-minded hobbyists, which you can find at bedroombattlefields.com forward slash discord. It'd be great to see you in there.